Well, um, my name is Mohamed Tarani. I'm, I'm the chair of the Aerosmith chapter at the Modern Interior I3 Purdue. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you here, as well as people online, for tonight's talk, which is really a treat for everybody. Um, those of us who have been involved in developing, in manufacturing instruments, gadgets, systems, we make them and send them out, but we don't know what happened to them. We, we never hear from the field people who are operating <laughs> what experience they had. And, uh, my knowledge, this is the first time we hear from somebody who has actually used instruments in, in the operations and uh, in, in the what happens. So uh, with that tonight, the uh, uh, topic is uh, the wide diesel program and uh, uh, <clears throat> the speaker is Jerry, Jerry Mark, Colonel Jerry Mark, who was uh, involved in the uh, many programs are very, very briefly in some of them. And then uh, uh, he is going to talk about what I just said earlier, you know, all these instruments which uh, uh, decline the threat environment and uh, uh, this, <coughs> the tactics used you know, with these instruments. Uh, and also the, the feedback that usually manufacturers get and should get is the um, improvements that they can make in those, uh, and that helps develop new and newer technologies for them. And so uh, it's really a special uh, evening for us in our chapter tonight. And uh, the speaker, Jerry, well, he, <clears throat> he was an Air Force pilot for 24 years, and uh, he flew numerous mission missions in Germany, uh, Mediterranean. Uh, uh, area uh, and then uh, he also flew a reconnaissance mission to North Vietnam which is I'm sure very scary you know uh, even now <laughs> um, and uh, so he's going to talk about the broad visa program and uh, how they were able to detect the same missile and uh, the triple um, after retiring from the Air Force, uh, Jerry became a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he was an angel uh, investor, and uh, he has worked with a lot of entrepreneurs. He has uh, uh, he started five companies, if I understand correctly, himself. Uh, he has mentored uh, about 300 other entrepreneurs for their companies. He was also, he had executive positions at two major uh, companies in Southern California, uh, the, <clears throat> the California Microwave uh, Incorporated, as well as in City of Woodlandville, and then American Nucleonics Corporation in West Lake Village. Jerry has a, a bachelor's degree in uh, electrical engineering, and MBA. Um, and also he's a graduate of the Defense Acquisition University Industrial College at Aeroporto, Air Command and Staff College, and also Aero College. Wow. What did you do all day? <laughs> we should give a lecture on how to do it all day. Uh, he's a life member of the I3 Purdue or Almanac, and um, uh, he has been after me to become a life member, so I went to the life member office and he said, I will become a member. They said, well, how old are you? I told them, they said, come back in 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm waiting for that. Anyway, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to ask Jay to come okay. and give his presentation. Uh, Ricker and I will be around here if they need. Uh, need be. Um, regarding questions, uh, <clears throat> ask questions in real time, both here as well as uh, the online. Uh, we can hear the questions and uh, Jerry will answer them. So it should, it should be a, a very fun evening. Okay, before it gets yeah. up, there's a short video that he wants to show you. So.
Good. Anybody know what YDVSM means? Yes. Oh, yes. You're not allowed to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Is you got to be kidding me. <laughs> the reason why it's there is because when this whole idea came about, I bet you're still aware of it. I bet it's correct. I have a picture with Stephanie and she was much younger. You can try that. Um, no, that's it. It's wrong. <clears throat> anyway, when they introduced what this was going to be, to the uh, small group of individuals, well, I'll show you an airplane. <clears throat> they said, Now I'm going to be in that airplane with the crazy fighter pilot, and we're going to go after Sam Sites with one missile. You got to be shitting me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to jump through this a little bit. Uh, I have 112 combat missions, uh, 327, 327 combat hours, I think. This is the first wild weasel, F-100. When this came about, it was the result of the F-4s and the thuds getting knocked out of the sky since Russia provided North Vietnamese the SAM missile. And so, the Pentagon had a meeting and said, you know, we shouldn't allow that to happen. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and they conjured up a nice committee and they went to North America uh, Aviation, North American Aviation, down in Long Beach. And they found themselves a nice little secure hangar and they set up shop to convert four of these F 100s, two seaters. And they configured him for this mission. It was a big bet. I had a bunch of my friends were in the first cat game. So anyway, <clears throat> these guys landed over in North in Thailand, Tokli, in uh, 1965 on uh, 20. It was no 20 November. Okay, their first mission was on 1 December. They killed the first SAM site on 22 December. And in the process, those four airplanes reduced themselves to two. They were shot down. One crew was killed, the other crew became guests of the Hanoi Hilton. Okay, well, <clears throat> these guys did a number of sorties and they worked with the Thuds as a strike force. And you find out real quick that the F-100 and the F-105 are not compatible mm -hmm. in many ways. And that's not my initial, but that was my hearing. <laughs> anyway, so they had to shift to the 105. And the 105 then became Wild Weasel 3. Wild Weasel 2 was a test bed. It never went to production. But these did. And these airplanes, I'm going to tell you how we created them, how we uh, equipped them, why we did that, what our weapons were, and now the reverse where I'll start will be why we we're there at the beginning. What did the Russians have in North Vietnam, uh, North Vietnam, other than some pilots they gave to the MiGs? I thought they were North Vietnamese pilots. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is Vietnam, and these areas are how we divided that area into root packs. And it starts right in here. This is root pack three, two, one down here, four, five, and root pack six. And it divided between the Navy and the Air Force. Of course, when the Navy had it, they shared it with the Marines. And we were supposed to stay in our area, and you did because you got a frag. A frag is the order for that day for your mission and your assignment. And it meant frag because it's a fragmented part of the master plan. So uh, my mention over here, just north of Hanoi, 
they renamed the ridge, that ridge, that's where all our supplies were because we shot down so many times. We have all kinds of parts up there. <clears throat> okay, now let's take a look at what the what the Russians really did for me. <clears throat> now it's really interesting. When I got involved in this, I was in Germany flying clandestine uh, covert missions against Russia in and out of Berlin, in the Baltic, in the Black Sea. And by the way, our target in the Black Sea was Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of fun. <clears throat> These are the radars that are in the system for the SA-2. This little jewel here is an acquisition radar that would then be, it could be miles away from the site and then provided information to the sites in advance of the strike. This one was also, uh, this is an S-band. This one is about 70 megahertz. So it wasn't quite as accurate. <laughs> and uh, it was, that's the way it was. When we were in Germany, flying these missions, our objective was to examine these type of radars in great detail. In fact, uh, the detail we did on these wasn't really impressive because they're not that impressive. But we had this little jewel <clears throat> and we could tell when they needed their magnetrons changed. That's how accurate. And we could tell if they could do stealth checks. Unbelievable equipment, and I'll show you that. So this is the system that made the whole process work. This little gem got in the way one day. And so we developed with the Navy a little project. I can't tell you the name of it because I'd have to shoot you. <laughs> but I can tell you what it did. We had the New Jersey part of our program. We had some F, uh, the D model, which is a single seat, and we had a bunch of weasels. And we had another airplane called Rivet Top. Rivet Top is a 121. <clears throat> I think it still exists. And if you go out to uh, Camarillo, they have a, a couple, they used to have two 121s out there. But these are the ones that had the big, Bluster on the top of one underneath. And this little airplane had the capability that's unbelievable. It was called Brigand. And Brigand would do this. We would, I was not a very favorite person for about a month because I took the control sticks out of two of the weasels, back seaters. <laughs> And we replaced it with a system that generated a squawk IFF unique to that airplane. Inside the 121, they had a system in a big scope, and they could present in that scope exactly what that I saw on the ground. So you can see what the difference is. All you do is transmit an IFF that comes on that scope. And guess what? The target's the center of the scope. Clever. We got to do that one time. And we're out. <laughs> coming in on an attack on the target. And I looked down, and there's a New Jersey with its 16 inch guns shooting a thing out of those guns that was as big as we were. So <laughs> we had to stay away from New Jersey. Anyway, that uh, worked one time. And that's the way it was with, with uh, every, every time you come up with some new idea, you get away with doing it once. And they were so fast, they would know exactly what you're doing the next time. So anyway, this is the inside of the van that controls this. Okay. And that band song is a deadly devil. These are the scopes. They have an elevation and a horizontal, and they track the airplane as you're showing there. They're showing that 
SR well, didn't really do much for the SR, but it did do something with the U2. And here it is, here's your airplane, and there's the radar. And now there's a little thing called, well, the missile ought to have some say in this, right? The guideline missile. And I'll talk about that. With you. Okay. This is the deadly bug. This little gem comes in two stages. The first stage is solid, the second stage is liquid. The first stage runs about six seconds, and then the other takes over, and hopefully it's not your flat. And the objective is not to hit the airplane. The objective is to get close enough. The proximity fuse goes, and you're gone. At the back end of the stage one, there's a little antenna. And when I showed you that, this little jewel right here is a guidance control antenna for the missile. <clears throat> now, they have to, the operators on the ground have to decide what that missile is going to do. Is it going to go ballistic or is it going to go guided? Because they have to put a plug in the missile before they launch it. Okay. And it would provide the connection to this little antenna that would now allow them to control where that missile was going. And I'll tell you how we played the other game. <laughs> so that's what that's all about. But it's very, very important to know that their range is 19 miles. Watch the range of the missile that I'm going to be going after that with. Okay, this is a typical SAM site. Six missiles and the control in the middle. Now, oftentimes they'll have the control off the side, as you see here. And this is the missile on the ramp or on this on this launch. And there's the bar lock and that. And by the way, uh, all the stuff we did in, in uh, when we were playing our game over in Europe was we had to know those radars. We had to know six or two different radars. And each one has its own sound, and each one has its own signature, and we had the chance to do both. And whenever this little jewel came online, you'd hear tick 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 tick. You knew what that was. There's no radar sounded like that. So I'll talk about the systems we put in the airplane. This is a, a launch of two of them. And uh, this is what happens when they get where they're going. This is an actual shootout of a weasel. And this guy got away with it. This guy, they missed him too. And here's the trick. So you're sitting there, you heard the signal, you're watching, and I'll show you the equipment you did this with. And so you say, okay, uh, they're going to watch. And you watch, you see the smoke. You put the missile in the center of the smoke ring. It depends how courageous you are. It's coming up at Mach 2. And you know that you're going to have to do something. And the call would go out, take it down. Immediately you roll over and pull it as hard as you can and then come back up. And about the time the missile's now coming up at you, then you take it back down. It's coming to Mach 2. Can't go. Can't bend. Enter, and if you're lucky, you got away with it. That guy didn't. <clears throat> okay. In addition to the Sands, they had other things. And this is Jane's favorite. You know who I'm talking about. Fun. They ought to change the name of that bitch. Okay. <laughs> yes. This is the fire can. And the fire can is what controls the guns. And you have a recognition of the sound and you see the signal of that. So you would know. But look at that, 23 millimeters. That's okay. Because when we're going down to get a sight, sometimes you have to, yeah, we only have one way of delivery. Well, two. We could launch a missile and I'll show you that. Or you go on the deck and climb in before the missile can't go down that low. But this little jewel here, two thirds of our losses were these guns. This little jewel go to 57,000 feet. 
And they say, well, that means the B-52s are in jeopardy. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what our missions were. And then this one, only the 20,000 feet. So no sweat. We were down at 15. All right, so now it's our turn. Okay, so that's the battle that you're gonna face. Now, how are you gonna take care of it? The first thing you gotta do is educate yourself to know when whatever is happening is actually happening. And in order to do that, you have to have equipment. This is what we call the, uh, the nose gunner, okay? He's allowed to sometimes fly the airplane and maybe shoot weapons. That is radar. The, I would say the business part of the operation is right there, that's the backseat. That is the best indicator we have. Now the whole this up came about when they had that meeting in Washington and formed a task force, they decided they would go to industry and see who they could do about some equipment. <laughs> ATI up in San Jose, California. And ATI and Dr. Grigsby ran that operation. They came up with these systems. Now, take this. This is the APR 25. And you see these marks? You see the rings? The longer those bar or those lines are, that tells you how more significant the threat is. A three ringer is a pretty serious devil. So you see the dot indicating what kind of a radar they're intercepting. And of course, each one has its sound. So you might have 16 sounds at one time. And that, that, uh, The radar for this, the SA-2, can track four, and well, they can target four and track three. So, and you're flying in a flight of two, but you're not going in fingertip. So anyway, this is the APR-25. This little jewel is a panoramic receiver for those of us that you know, experience in the world saw this operation going. That's really handy. Most of the most of the, uh, the weasels didn't use that, but it really helps you tell what the what the whole scenario is in that environment. And uh, then we have a little jewel that tells you when the missile launches. Well, that's good information. Eventually, we had a new unit in there. It told when you're the target. And it was an asthma sector like AX. And you know, it didn't take many beers to change the name. Actually, we called the off ship on that. Because that meant in your formation, you are the target, not your unit, you. And so you better be attentive to that and be prepared to do something about it. So we love the asthma sector. In addition to that, we had jammers. The Pentagon mandated that every weasel had to carry one jammer. And we didn't win that war because that meant we only had one missile. Because the jammer took the spot on the wing where the, our missile would go. This little jammer was pretty good, AFQ-71. We always loved that. We always treated it right, and it took care of us. What it did was he took out the, the AAA, and it did a good number on that beacon. And his primary purpose was to kill the beacon. That means if they launched, and they were going to guide it, we broke up the beacon, it's gone ballistic, and we can do what we want, mostly get the hell out of there. And then we had another pod, that's this one right here, the Q, QRC-335. This must be the, the answer to the universe. It was a self-driven pod. The jammer antennas were on each end. And it was supposed to pick up the signal and take care of it, and you didn't have to do anything about it. Well, I was the, the wing guy for all this stuff. And so one day I was carrying that missile and it decided to sing. 
There's nothing worse than a jammer that decides to sing because it doesn't know the song. So I came back and I called, I called headquarters Seventh Air Force and told them, and they loved me down there because I just say, you that's what you say we're going to do, but we're not. In this case, I said I've just grounded all the 335 plots, and I could hear the noise. <clears throat> and they said, "Why?" I said, "Because it's singing." And they said, "You can't ground them." I said, "I don't understand that word." Okay. Dan never did anything. So I said, we were grounding them, and we did. And just by coincidence, we had a two star general that started this whole thing visiting all the bases. And I, he came to Karat, so I grabbed a hold of him. I said, I need to show you something. So I took him into our lab, avionics lab, and I had it all set up. So we powered it up. And we had a signal off to the side from the simple signal generator. And I said, hit it, one pulse. And both things start ringing. He said, and I said, how do you like that? Do you like that song? He said, they're grounded. <laughs> and I never, you know, I never saw them before I left again. But everybody's trying, you know. When it worked, it would be OK. The problem was there was no isolation between those antennas. But they did the air, you know, if you do an antenna pattern, you can tell if it's gonna wrap around someplace. I said, put some doggone material there and it'll kill that pattern so it won't go down the length of the machine. So they said, well, we're gonna send it back and let them worry about that, <laughs> which they did. Okay, all right. That's your desire of that. We had two different missiles. One was the AGM-45 and the other was the AGM-78. And I don't know if you understand, but all the missiles are built by the Navy. And they were fantastic working with us on these. AGM-45, remember I said the range? I have only seven miles. They have how many? Do you think that's incompatible? It's called, why are you there? Well, you got to be there to deliver 149 pounds of explosive. That's so exciting. That's like a super firecracker. And then when we got the AGM-78, it grew a little bit, and we had a much better range. Certainly compatible. Now that little gem, there's the 45 up there, and here's the 78, the big one. <clears throat> You're flying the 78, you're going into the harm area, you see the signal and you want to use it. You saw the missile launch on that video? That was an AGM-78. You knew it when, you, when it was leaving your airplane. Because it lit you and everybody else up. So you line up the system to track the target you just found, lock it on the missile and say, okay, I'm done. And 180 degrees and launch it. It would turn around and it doesn't care whether that signal is up or not. This one had to have the signal. And that AGM 78 come piling in. Boy, they now the game was what are the call signs and the weasels? The guys on the ground knew every one of our call signs. Our call signs were all cars, Packard, Cadillac, that they knew them all. Well, Robin Olds, have you ever heard of him? He was a Tiger. And he ran the F-4s, and they did MiG cap for us. They would always be up there. If there's any MiGs, that is not a MiG compatible airplane. It's the fastest thing on the, on the ground, or just above the ground. It was a nuclear bomber. It had a bomb bay. But it was not good to go chase and make, so we were not allowed. Anyway, uh, the decision was, let's do something different. Since we're losing so many of, of these airplanes because they know the call sign, let's swap call sign. So the weasels took on the strike force or the, the mid cap, 
Call signs and the men cap took on the Ouija's. They had a turkey shoot. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many airplanes they really shot that. We wouldn't stay around to watch. Mm -hmm. But anyway, one time. <laughs> we knew it next time. Uh, Jerry? Yeah. Uh, in 78, what kind of Seekers, did you have? Uh, did you have a guidance system? Or no. Just a... Well, yeah, we did. Yeah. As a matter of fact, on the 78 and the 45, you could set the target in. But on the 45, it had to have that target there. And as soon as they saw that that was launched from an airplane, they turned the transmitter on, off. They... So we used to play little games. We just go up there and never tell them we're lighting up. And of course, they were playing a counter game called, how do you like dummy loads? <laughs> so you're climbing around there and just pulling around and uh, very low signal, maybe a one ringer. And you're just on top of them and damn it, it's three ringers and launch. So you had to be very, very careful how you played that game because at Mach 2, you don't have any chance. It's over. But... Uh, on the AGM-78, once you locked a position, it took a position, not a signal. So you could turn around 180, launch it, and it'll come right around and go for it. It knows where to go. Okay? There's nothing more fun than, than listening to the audio out of these missiles while they're on your airplane. Because you have to assure that it's listening to the right thing. Okay? All right. In addition to the one strike, we often carry four 500 pound bombs or two 750s or a 2000 or four CBU-24s. Now the CBU-24s are really a nasty, nasty weapon. Anti-personnel, it's, it's a container that's holding these small bombs the size of a baseball. And when you release them, they open at a certain altitude and they just spread everywhere. Now, some of those little items will go off immediately. Later, much later, and much, much later. It just depends on what they want to do. And the, the real good way to take out a SAM site if you're really courageous. As you come in low, you pop up, drop one of those right over the whole setup. You catch all the missiles and the van and everything and everybody there. And you only do that once. Because the guy that's sitting there next door watching this said, ain't gonna do that to me. And of course, we had a Gatling gun, 20 millimeter. And uh, a Vulcan, and what was really funny about that, it didn't carry that many bullets. So if you're going to use it, you better press that button quick and stop because it'll go room and it's out. So we didn't use that anymore than we had to. They had them on the 100s, so they, that's how they took out their, their site. They had, they had rockets because they didn't know anything about these missiles at the time with the 100s. Yeah. All right, here's the typical arrangement. We were at Karat, our other wing was at Takli. Our trip was there, or in any one of these, that's the DMZ, anything on here was fair game, and you would see that on your frag, what your target was. And this was back before I went there, they had this kind of a formation. This was a B-66, which was a jammer bird, and it was going blast and jamming. And then you had four weasels and they would break off when they got into the target area and they break off in flights of two. This is our in-flight refueling over Laos. And uh, that's exciting. The one thing you would must do when you're in a thud on an in-flight refueling is dump the pressurization. But if you don't, sometimes the boomer forgets to shut the gas off. And so you get a face full of gas. I'll tell you what, that's not exciting because you're totally blind and you're still hanging on a tanker. That's not a good position to be in. So we always remind the boomer, 
Shut it off. <laughs> he knows how much he's given us. We had one time, I wasn't there, flight of four, and these were all the, the uh, demos, the strike force. And they were on the, you know, shifting between taking their turn on the tanker, and then the, the first guy gets off and he comes back and gets the top off. One of those guys, I don't remember which one it was, uh, the other members of the flight said, you got a hanger. And what that means is one of your bombs is hanging loose and it's not connected and you can't release it. He just pulled off and gone, blew up. Those are not fun days. When we did that little trick with the New Jersey we got it here. <clears throat> Okay, so this is pretty quick, you know. I'm staying on schedule. This is this is the bad news. Okay, we had 610 single seats. 283 were shot down. 53 were operational losses. That means they weren't they weren't uh, shot down. Mechanical stuff. We had 143 wild weasels. We lost 45 and two were operational losses. You know, when you look at that and they said, you know, your probability of survival is in the 30% range. That means if you got three airplanes, you get two back. That only happened one time. The back seater was killed. The front seater became a guest of Hanoi Hilton. Mm -hmm. Last his last assignment was base commander at Mayther Air Force Base. And ironically enough, it was fun because of course he was one of our guys. And I was a commander of the Washington Area Contracting Center at the time. And uh, they needed cable. And when cable brought into Washington for the bases and the hospitals. I knew he did it out in Mayther, so I called him up and got his contract, and they're still using the same cable. Okay. Here's, here's some more stats. Of the 54 wild weasels, and that includes a G model, 47 were lost. Those were the G models. If you go to the museum in Dayton, you'll find, and I'm gonna show you a picture of that, we dedicated the wild weasel exhibit there many years ago. And remember, a lot of these losses were guns, not missiles. So, that's our gang there at Karat. You see where I am. <laughs> I'm there. I was a little younger. But you know, when you get a, an assignment, let's say when you get an assignment like that, it isn't something you just go say, I'm going to be, because all the stories they tell you about military personnel are right. If you say you want it, you don't get it. So you're, you have two bets. Either pick the one that they know you don't want or don't pick anything and then take your chances. Six of us played that game at Wiesbaden when we were all being transferred and we all got weasels. Unfortunately, one of them, everybody came back except for one. And he was flying in a pack four, going to pack at five and six, and uh, they were jumped by MiGs. Well, if you have munitions like weapons, bombs, stuff, and you're jumped by MiGs and you're in a thud, the first thing you do is drop everything and get the hell out of there and let the MiG cap take care of it. Well, he had a flight above him, and they had CBU-24s. And when they released the, one of the uh, airplanes above released their cbu uh, 24 and it opened up one of those golden BBs right in his lap. Now the pilot did not know because he absorbed everything. Didn't do much damage to the airplane. The only way he knew that something happened is his wingman said, you don't have a canopy in the back. Mm -hmm. so, so he went to Da Nang and that's how they found out. 
And that young man had six kids. Okay. This is at the Air Force Museum in Washington. That was our dedication of the wild weasel exhibit. It's massive in there. And they've now added the F4. And the current weasels, it's the program still ongoing, is the F-16. And, that, and that's getting old. So the F-35 will be the next weasel. Now, the reason you got one person in those, the systems have become far more exotic and more automatic. So they can handle it. I've talked to the F-16 guys, said, how the hell do you do it? And of course, their weapons that they're facing are 10 times worse than ours. They're, those, those missiles they're firing are unbelievable. And, uh, but the system is, seems to be working. We're not losing their plans. You know? He said, well, you have any trouble sending F-15? No one ever shot one down. Okay, that's that. And uh, that's the gang. It was left for that particular reunion. We probably have two thirds of them left. Okay. Oh, there's life after. That's that. After weasels, I went into another program called Big Safari. And uh, that's an RB 57F. You look at that wingspan, put that airplane down on a run or you know, on a football field. One tip of the wing is under the goalpost. You walk across it until you fall off on the 50 yard line. That's yeah, in order to qualify to fly in that thing, you had to go in a chamber down in Florida to 100,000 feet with one more guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Canberra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was created by Big Safari. It was really fun. And he said, well, we need an airplane that could carry the same payload as a U-2 or an SR. but must be able to loiter. The U-2 can loiter, and the SR sure can loiter. <laughs> they loiter. They gotta come all the way back around through four countries. So they said, I like the Canberra. So they got a Canberra and they cut the nose off, cut the tail off, cut the wings off, and created what is called a class five mod. Big Safari could not build anything new, but we do have the authority to do a class five mod. That was a result. Two years ago, I got a call from NASA because they were taking one of them out of the boneyard. NASA always flies two of them. And they said, we need another RB-57F. They were going to the boneyard. What was the last one you flew? And I gave them my tail number and they took it over to Denver and you should see that thing. It's gorgeous. So anyway, I didn't see any questions. Yes. Well, I heard that at some point the B-52s, when they were facing the SAM missiles, they refused to fly. And I never found what happened after that. I just heard that they went on strike and we're not flying because yeah. we're getting shot down too much. Well, I'll tell you what. The first thing is the person that told you that probably ought to read it correctly. There's never going to be any Air Force pilot or crew doing that. They knew what the weapons were and what they were facing. The problem we have with SAC is trying to convince them because when they were doing the bombing, and by the way, our missions were Iron Hand, and that was a Navy name that everybody adopted. And that meant you're going for a target. And we had another one called C, suppression of the enemy air defense. That's kind of a hunter killer operation. You just go out and troll. See what you can find. Then we had buff support, really called park flight B-52s. The weasels had to protect the B-52s from the SA-2 missile. And we call them buff support, big ugly something. Okay. I pitied the SAC crews. When they flew further south, by the way, when we were protecting, they would drop their bombs before they even went over the DMZ and they would fly in because they were up so doggone high. And uh, they would fly in a cell of three. And the day before they would done their mission, you could hear on guard, heavy artillery warnings and they would give the vectors of the targets. And I said, well, that's another batch of monkeys. I hope they got the word. 
because everybody else has guard. They know where that is. I don't know why they ever did that, but they did all the time we were there. They were flying those cells of three into Hanoi every day at the same time, at the same altitude, at the same heading across 47 airplanes until somebody got some courage and went to SAC headquarters. I think he was started with a colonel and he got them together and said, enough of this crap. We don't need to lose any more of those airplanes. And certainly think about how many, air, how many people are on those airplanes. And we told them, you've got to stop that because they just sit there and wait. See, we're going on the coffee break. They're not due yet. They have the guns set up. The missiles are set up. They just have to wait. Watch their watch. Here they come. You'll get them. That's stupid. And every general that was involved in that should have been fired on the spot for being so damn dumb. Okay. Now, so what did they do? We showed them how we do it. And that was, we never come in the same angle, the same altitude, anything the same. And then you could look at the tracks of what the B-52s did, and their concern was how many mid-airs? None. And they were coming in from all different angles, different times, and they really had them on the run. If we just had Kissinger get sick, stay the hell out of it, we could have won that war in the middle of it. Because those B-52s, they should have been there in day one. They didn't have the missiles. So that's crazy. Anyway, that's the way we would fight a war, you know. No opinions on that. Don't you know, right. Well, <laughs> yes, my you told me this before. How many missions did you fly? Well, as a wild reason? I put 112. Yeah, they said one more. I said no. So you use my new favorite abbreviation YGDS again. Right. And and you've got all these you are listening for all these radar clips and there's all this stuff yeah. going on. How do you stay focused? It's called Do You Like How You're Built? <laughs> do you want to keep those parts? The best thing you can do is what you need to do. And it's funny. It just happens. It's like when you're in that pressure suit, you reverse breathe. And how do you do that? You don't tell yourself. It just doesn't. Instead of you breathing in, it breathes in for you. You breathe out. So when you're flying those missions, you have to be attentive to what's going on. Now, your hands are full with all that equipment, and you're listening, and you're watching, and... <laughs> We often kid some of the crews because sometimes they have a dialogue that goes on forever. Uh, every mission that I flew and all, we, all the angels flew was recorded. And I have a stack of discs about like that. And if you want an exciting day, you can sit there and listen to a lot of breathing and sometimes very heavy breathing or actually somebody says something. <laughs> One time near the end of my tour, I was a member of the Stan of Al for the wing, and uh, 7th Air Force said, Pack half wants everybody to have a Stan of Al ride. So we got all the Stan of Al guys together and says, YGBSM <laughs> says, Okay, how are we going to do this? I said, Piece of cake. Well, how are we going to do it? It says, you take off and we record your name and your number. And of course, I have all that stuff. And you come back alive, you just pass. <laughs> and if anybody wants to argue with that, let them to me. So, what are you going to do? Have a fly on a wing? Okay. So 150, 150? 112. 112. Yeah, I wouldn't that, do 13 twice. Was that typical? Who flew the, the No, because, see, the tradition there was if you flew 100 missions, you went home. When I arrived at Karat, we were flying up to three times a day. And some of those missions were only two hours and some might be four. Well, you can add that up pretty quick and find out when do you eat and when do you sleep? And there's a problem because you run out of time before you run out of need. Okay. So I said, no, we got to stop this nonsense. Again, I'm in favor for such for a while. I said, we're going down to two missions max. Mm -hmm. See, we had another mission that we added on because the 111s were having trouble. Mm 
The 111s were sent in there to do night radar, low level bombing. Well, unfortunately, the mountains in North Vietnam are karst, which means their surface is flat. And at an angle, you're in there with radar, what happens? Bing, you never saw it. And they were losing 111s. And so finally, SecDef said, one of his more intelligent comments, which he didn't make many of, we're not gonna do that with 111s. Who are we gonna do it with? Well, they, commit, they created a program called Commando Nail. Well, I just have to have fancy names. And they supposedly configured the airplanes to have a better radar and all this, which they didn't. They put four airplanes together and they lost all four. So they said, okay, how about the weasels? So we had a number of, we had eight crews that volunteered and I was one of them. I said, hell, that just needs more counters. What are you talking about? Night low level radar, no problem. When we're up there trolling around during the day, we'll just run some of our radar on that target and I'll come back with some pictures and I could see it. But we had radar version one and a half. So the quality of the photograph was worse. And all you had to do is head into that target right on the heading and deviate a tenth of a degree and the whole picture changed because of those cars. So we had a rule, okay, how many kids do you have? You have a wife and kids, okay. That's 500 feet each. So we we're flying terrain following radar. The thud had, I swear, version one. And we do it's mechanical. So you have to set up all the dials and this is what you're gonna use. And uh, so you go in at night alone, mostly but when you really want it, it's no moon. So that's nice and good. If you need any excitement, you light the burner and that tells you where the guns are. Mm -hmm. But then you're going in and you're gonna hit the target. Well, there's one mission. I had a 50 mile bomb. That means I had to go to 7th Air Force and explain it. <laughs> what happened, we, the monsoons over there are absolutely crazy. When it rains, I'm telling you, we've never seen anything like that here. When it rains, it rains. And Karat had a little dip in the runway. So when you're going to take off, you're going to splash right through that. But you see the thud has a canopy to lift up. And you ain't under an umbrella. So that airplane's going to be nice and wet when you get in that night. So we were at the club having dinner. And uh, we try not to drink two hours before we're flying. So, you know, 100% oxygen, we did a number on it. It was godsend. <laughs> anyway, so we go out to the airplane, get in, start it up, and we're carrying four or 500 pound bombs. So, okay, now we're going down to the, the arming area, and they pull all the ribbons and everything off of all the bombs. And believe it or not, we had a Catholic priest that was there. I'm not Catholic, but he was there for everybody. He stood in front of that airplane in spite of the rain and blessed that airplane, every airplane before they went to the runway. So anyway, so we're down there and everything checked. So we're at the runway and we're alone. So we take off when we want and we go up and we're heading to the tanker in, in Laos. And uh, I just passed NKP, which is the, the last city before you're into Laos from Thailand. And I hear boom, boom. And there is absolute silence in the airplane. And then word was, oh shit. And we rolled over and we were secondaries. And I immediately checked where the hell we were while well, we were beyond NKP, otherwise we'd have wiped out the damn base. And so we start check, doing checklists and all that stuff and checking radars, front and back and all that. And, uh, and we called abort and told the tank, you know, we call Crown and they, they had canceled all the stuff. And so we came back to Karat. Remember, I'm part of the wing staff. So my boss is the chief of ops. So he came in and he said, what happened? And we told him, he said, okay. He called maintenance in, he says, go find out what's wrong with that airplane. Normally you would hear, what the hell did you do, right? He never said that. He said, what's wrong with that airplane? And maintenance took off and about an hour later, we sat there drinking coffee, damn it. 
And he came back in about an hour. He said, he shook our hands. He said, you're the luckiest sons of bees I ever knew. That was a bad relay and it could have happened at any time, including on roll. Of course, we got rid of the bombs before we landed, but obviously they fell off the airplane. Crazy things like that happen. You know, you know this hat, this is our go to hell hat. Yeah. And it's, see, now there's something there. It's grass balls. <laughs> That's awarded to you by a Thai nurse <laughs> after your first admission. So, and every 10 missions, you had to leave the base for three days. Because what happens is you get complacent. You say, no one's going to get me. Look what I've done. And they say, really? Go to Bangkok. I went, I went to Tokyo and bought all my electronic equipment. <laughs> but, uh, and I also ordered every, all the stuff that Mary was in Pittsburgh. And the mailman thought I was sending time in that <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, every 10 minutes, you it. then when you come back, you cannot be leaving until you have three flights. Yes. So they're very protected. And of course, we caught the number of flying to two a day. And what happens in the morning, it could be very early in the morning, and you're going to break, and that takes an hour. And then you get geared up with all that, and you carry your gun and your flight vest and all that crap. And you go out in the airplane, that takes a while. And if you're not in one of the airplanes, you're spared. So you sit on the side and wait. If all four of those airplanes make the tanker without a problem, you're off for a couple hours because you're on primary the next next flight. And then if you go that one, then at night, after midnight, you're on a Ryan Raider mission. <laughs> And how do you get used to that? You do. And when we first got there to Karat, we had a hooches. The building had four rooms, two man per room, and the weasels only flew with the same guy all the time. We never figured out how that worked. When we went to Dallas first day, they told us that by Friday you had to crew up because we had an equal number of front seat and back seat. And you have to try to see them up. So about the third day, we went to the bar and had a bunch of drinks and sat around the table. And then we went to start. And one guy in crazy said, yeah, I want him. Done. And that's why we were on the table. And there was no question and no adjustments. And we've talked to psychiatrists and the else. How the hell did that happen? I know a guy for three days. And you know who you want to fly Because you're never going to fly with anybody else unless he's dead. Or you're dead. And that's the way it went. So each of those coaches had those two man crews. And uh, the center of the building was the head, all the showers and stuff. But, uh, and we were 20 steps from the bar. <laughs> we knew that. That's how we found our way home. <laughs> so, anyway. Why do you do something like that? Well, we're sitting around, like I said, you don't want to play games with personnel. We were very fortunate. First of all, we had a lot of knowledge of that, what we were going to face. And we discovered the dummy load in a trip into Berlin one day. So we even saw that in real life and what to watch for. So we had to teach everybody else the reasons. But uh, you just look at this thing. Well, you really want to be able to say you lived in interesting times. Yeah. That didn't work. Okay. Uh, it just happened. And when we met this guy that came back, he'd been in the week, and he was flying with us, and he was a good job, your guy. And uh, he told us what the missions were and how it went and all the things about it. And we just sat down and said, yes, that's what we want to do. And we kept our mouth shut to get all got assigned. And uh, four of us were assigned, went through the training at the same time. So, how old were you? 
Uh, well, let's see, that was 1968, about 30. How old were the act was the average? I don't want to start with you. Uh, I would say the pilots were old pilots because they had a bigger demand in their requirements. These were all, most of these guys were in Europe when we were there at, at various bases, flying pilots, and some had been flying force, but they volunteered for the job. Yeah. And, uh, and my uh, my guy was well, he had six kids. He just died last year in '93. So so we got along with that. Yes. In the '60s, the laser light was not in use. Do I think these days it's much easier because of your years like this, years that years are using the aircraft. How well, do you feel? Comfort, comfort. What do you know? I'm not sure I understood the last part of your Laser, now we are using laser, wind laser, right? Yeah. Do you think things have got much, much better? So, yeah. are you in contact with someone like your. You yeah, I, I'm. Went not. through. How do you feel now? Just going high in touch. Well, I'm, I deal with a lot of high school kids. And we run a, an annual internship program at the Cal Lutheran that lasts one week, the third week of June. This year, we're going to have 60 kids. And uh, we have 17 high schools in San Francisco. These are all ROTC kids. And then we have a bunch of ones around here. And that's where they come from. And someone says, they're worried about you. Well, I would suggest you go out and meet you. Because they're not after rabble rousing like we've seen on the news. Mm -hmm. These kids are solid citizens. They have a mission. I teach them how to write a, a light play. Wow. I said it's very important that you have a light play. You have a point you want to be at a certain time in your life. And you said everything you do between now and then has to contribute to that, or you adjust the target, which is okay. But then you do the same thing. And if you are doing something that doesn't contribute to the success of that path, you're not allowing it. Really, you're off your play. And I then asked them after I presented that, I asked them, how many people have a life plan? Actually, I asked them before I started talking. Wow, half the class. And I asked, okay, I'll, I'll take that bet. And I asked one of the students to come up and explain what it is. And they truly have a life that doesn't even show up to you. Whoa. And whenever I, I work also with the Army ROTC at the Truth Get Big, and uh, those are really, I said, your Army, you like tents? You should have been in the Air Force. We don't live in tents. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You got a question? Can we hear? Yeah, I should be able to uh, speak through your mic. Through yeah. A question. Go ahead. Uh, you said a fair bit about losses. I wondered if you could tell us about uh, any characterization on the successes of the Wild Weasel program. Well, if you have people that are still alive, that's pretty much a success, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't, you know, thinking in the broader military context. <laughs> okay. Well, the whole thing is when the program was developed, there were a whole new set of rules for the Air Force, and the Navy picked up, and the Marines. And now it's really different, but they still have the same attitude and the same goal. And these kids that are flying the 16s are really good. And by the way, there's a bunch of women there. In fact, we have a little problem when we have reunions because we have to get the girls aside and said, got to watch your language. They're fighter pilots. But honestly, that's the only answer I can give you, except we're not having any trouble getting people to volunteer to do this. So that speaks well. And it's a very well-defined mission. So... Does that help? Yes, but what I wondered is in the context of the whole uh, conflict, how many uh, 
uh, air defense sites were taken out, something along oh, okay. the line. And how many missions could proceed to do bombing runs uh, and take out uh, enemy assets? Well, the, the problem we had was we didn't, we couldn't get many missions because uh, our well-advised Secretary of Defense was a moron and he forgot to buy more bombs. So we had almost four weeks with no bombs. So that really kind of cuts down your time. And uh, every time, every time we tell him, you know, there, we couldn't go near High Fall. Some young captain one time, and his wing commander was Broden. He wrote a book, by the way, Thud Ridge. And it's really interesting because this kid was ticked off because the only way we could attack a SAM site is if it was up and running and they shot at us. And you could watch those SAMs offloading at High Fong and go in there where they're starting to build. And you could see the construction. We couldn't touch it until they were, they were operational. Well, he got pissed off. So he dropped a 500 pound bomb down the smokestack of one of the Russian uh, ships. That didn't go over well in Washington. Broden retired, and I don't know what they did with the captain, but they we cheered him on. That happened before I got over there. I was looking for some numbers for you because I do have them. Uh, well, you know, it's ironic because ever since the war's over and all that, we're friends with the Vietnamese, and some of the Russian generals have already contributed before Putin got in there. And they told us that they had a total of 98 SAM systems. That means uh, those three radars. And they had 7,500 guideline missiles. Well, at the end, after, after uh, linebacker two, they had 45 systems left and 2,300 guideline missiles. And that's what happened. And of course, B-52s, you know, the, the, the weasels that were flying up there in linebackers said it was a very boring trip because they were on those SAMs. Oh. So they could stay out of the guns, no sweat. They could hit their targets. And all I had to do was stay the heck out of the way of the B-52s. Okay. Did that help? Yes, it did. I mean, it knocked out half the SAM sites, roughly. Yeah. Is yeah. The, way, the way I read it. And that no well, other aircraft to go ahead and do their their uh, uh, actions. Yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of aviation thing. One night we had a, uh, I think it, I don't think it was Ryan rated, but we had a flight into midnight, total darkness, no moon, nothing, and we had an interdiction target, which is really exciting at night, at least where you know where it is. That means you're coming in straight and level and drop a bomb and get the hell out of there. Well, we went in, dropped ours. We had four 500 pound bombs and dropped them. And by the time we pulled out, I counted 50 airplanes in the air because of all the explosions and the light was coming out of the bomb. By the time we headed towards Laos, you could see the fires from Laos. So we must have hit one big ammo dump. And there were so many airplanes in there. And you know, it's so amazing when you're flying up there at night, no lights. Like I said, if it gets boring, you light the burner and then you can see where the guns are because they're going to shoot at you. And of course, you're gone from where that was. But you never saw another airplane. When the bombing halt, and Johnson was very famous for the bombing halt. So when you go to the club at Karat, You'd see two pictures, the king, well, the king and queen, and Johnson. And Johnson's picture was always dripping. Because <laughs> every time he called a bombing hall, we threw him in the bottom of the pool. One time they decided they're going to have a 500 mission party. That meant one guy did 200 missions, and the other three did 100 missions. So we had a big blast. We were drinking French 75s. Okay. The ambassador came up from Bangkok. And I guess he said something to somebody, but the next time I saw him, he was very wet. <laughs> but it's really crazy. So, yes. Do you have a favorite uh, 
ever wrap the uh, in your career? Well, you know, after I left the Weasels, I was building airplanes. It's very special stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly uh, exciting stuff, but if you're an Intel guy, the thud always stands out. Mm -hmm. I mean, that thing's like driving a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. It was so good. Uh, but you want to make sure that you have your helmet on right. Because when that engine's running, I was about two nanoseconds from going crazy because something happened in my ear that's not in there but the ear flap had twisted i had to take the helmet off and fix it put it back on i damn near didn't make it mm -hmm. because the noise was so big and heavy mm -hmm. yeah. but you learned yes sort of i don't know i want to put you on the spot but you see a parallel between ukraine and vietnam well, the, the one parallel that, that comes just at the very top is who's providing what? When we went to Vietnam, we had an awful lot of Chinese and Russian stuff because they couldn't make it in North Vietnam. And so everybody said, why are we arming the Ukrainians? Nobody does that. Well, really, you're 50 years behind times. That's exactly what they did in Vietnam. So that's not different at all. And the one that has the best systems usually wins a war, except when you get a politician involved and it doesn't matter. <laughs> right? Did you see the questions on my screen? Yeah, uh -huh. uh, okay. we have a couple of questions <clears throat> online. Okay, could you use an external mic and send a laptop? No, let's go back to yeah. this one. <laughs> this one is more <laughs> <laughs> I haven't answered that. No. <laughs> Besides the US. Or beside the Mordor Five, were there any F4 or Starfire? Yes, after the thuds uh, ran, well, we ran out of thuds. We lost so many of them. The F4s were the next weasels. And when I left, we hadn't seen those yet. I left in, uh, in uh, April, April, no, I, it was January of 69. I had finished my tour one year and the F4s were just starting to come in. And they, they did a great job. I knew a bunch of the guys who were flying those and they were very well equipped. They had newer equipment, and but they say had the same weapons that uh, they had. And see, 1968 was the end of uh, Rolling Thunder. Rolling Thunder started in, uh, I think, 65. And that was the mission going on. And in 68, just after I left, Rolling Thunder came to an end. And it wasn't much longer than that when Johnson said bombing halt, or not Johnson, but uh, Nixon. Nixon said uh, no more bombing north. So that killed that whole program. But it wasn't necessary because they were negotiating because of B-52s and that stuff. So, yeah, but the F-4s got in there and they held their own and then and then a number of years ago, we changed the F-16s, and they're now in two locations in the country, and they're, they were in the Gulf War, and, uh, and what we're doing now, and they're not, they're not in Iraq or Iraq, not Iraq, you know. You know what I'm I, I have a related question. The 105 and F-4 were the Air Force planes. Yeah, right? well, the F-4 was flown by the Navy also. But I not the thud. What was the involvement of the Navy in the whole wide wizards project? Well, they were doing a similar program. Separate or yeah, separate? Yeah, no, no, the, the services would, would communicate, you know, if you're up there on a mission, the frags were all shared. So everybody knew what the missions were and, and all that stuff. So nobody was confused like they were before. Because by 1970, if I'm right, they had the F-14s. With the Phoenix system, they yeah. can target six different targets. Oh, yeah, fantastic. So it was a much superior aircraft to F 4. Well, but that was after the F 4. Right. Yeah. So were they using that as a uh, wide? The F 14 was never used like that because they, they could do 10 times more work. That you know, the F 4 had limitations. Air, air. Uh, yeah, well, they had the yeah, Phoenix okay. could go air to air, correct? And yeah. also air to ground. Yeah. Depending how you 
target to the was, targeting information into the. I don't think they had any targets in Vietnam. Their targets were in the Gulf War. Okay. Well, yeah, later on, that's right. The guy that ran the air war in the Gulf War was a weasel. He ended up getting four stars. And he created a program called, um, what the hell was the name of that thing? Well, I'll think of it. Anyway, the idea was buy a bunch of Navy drones from Thousand Oaks back when Northrop was building those drones here and take them. We had an office. This was a big safari job. We had an office in Ontario with Lockheed. Take the missiles back to Lockheed. And they would configure them for ground launch. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea, idea was to be on the border and launch these crazy things that were tuned to look like an F-15. Okay. And so when the buzzer went off in the, pen, in the White House, they were the first launch. And they all went into Baghdad. They didn't have any weapons in them. They just looked like airplanes. And that brought up all the SAM sites, all the guns, and the weasels at force were in there, they took them all out. We owned the air war immediately. Scathe Mean was the name of the project. I got to write the book on it. We have another question. We yeah. Just like a comment. There was a NASA RB-57 flying over South Texas monitoring space. Sorry. Yeah. That's what they use it for. They're, NASA has two of those airplanes. And uh, they take good care of it, too. And they're all white. Did, did the Navy use the, uh, the A-6 uh, as a wild weasel at all? Do you know? No, I know they didn't. OK. Yeah. Uh, they really they didn't designate an airplane as a wild weasel. They just adopted the mission. And it didn't matter because, you know, we didn't patent it or copyright it. I, I, I don't know if you saw the, uh, did you see the movie, The uh, Flight of the Intruder? Yes. Was any of that uh, Hanoi type uh, uh, action uh, anywhere near uh, real or, or is that just pretty much just Hollywood? No, that was pretty real. If you see the latest uh, Top Gun Maverick, mm -hmm. there is nothing that I've ever seen from Hollywood that was more real and really real than that. Because even the cast had to fly in the airplanes. They had 15 cameras in each cockpit and they weren't fooling. Yeah, the stars weren't in the front seat, but they were in the back seat and they all got to fly those airplanes. So when they did the flight scenes, those were real flight scenes. They weren't simulated in some lab. And wow, when you think about that, you sit there, uh, a lot of us were sitting on the edge of our seat. That was really something else. Well, I tell you, I, I live I live one mile away from Miramar Air oh, Base, wow. and and I do miss I do miss those Tomcats. Yeah, they yeah. they had a lot of them out here. Now now it's the uh, only the uh, the eight teams and the and a few F F thirty fives now that I see over my house. Well, the F thirty five aren't bad. They're just not fast. <laughs> They're 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 pretty noisy. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. Question here. Question. Uh, you're obviously flying over labs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I understand there was a lot of ordnance that got dropped on labs. No. No. Well, I was. Uh, on purpose. No. Well, the ones that fell off my airplane did. Well, it fell off. <laughs> or you talked about a few times where. You got into a situation you just dumped all your <laughs> Oh no, that's that's further in. That's it in Vietnam itself. Because yeah. that's when you got an alpha strike going in and it's all loaded with bombs and they get jumped by MiGs. And of course you're not going to be in Laos when that happens. Right. We did have a problem because uh the North was really clever and they moved a SAM site almost to the DMZ. Well, the Marines had a, a mortar radar that sounded very much like a SAM site, Fansel. And uh, I saw that one day and I said, oh, whoa. And I went down to 7th Air Force and talked to some Marine generals and I said, we got to do something. 
because somebody's going to catch a shark. Because the first thing we have is if we're down there, we're there because of B-52s and we can't afford to have a SAM site aimed up at the B-52, especially there. And they said, Dan, that's right. And I said, what do you have for a solution? I said, let's use a call sign. And if on guard, if we call that sign, shut that damn radar down. Well, they still didn't listen. They caught a shark, but they didn't do it again. <laughs> then he used it. They moved a, an SA-2 to Chapeau. And that's a very dangerous area. Now you're getting really close to the B-52s. And we searched many, many days trying to find that site. Finally found it. They had hit that thing so well. And of course, Ho Chi Minh Mail, or uh, the, the trail was always good for just dropping whatever you had. But we didn't do that. We didn't have time to find where the trail was, where we were. But there was a lot of, there was action all over the place. The helicopters going everywhere. One time, after I've started to tell you before, one time when during the bombing call, the weasels were charged with protecting the RF4C photo birds. They were going for BDA, bomb damage assessments. And we had a flight of two that we were watching and we were up there watching how they're doing. And uh, I even had the name of the, what the heck was the name of the, Triton. Triton was their call sign. Our call sign was, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever it was. It was our 82nd mission. And so all of a sudden we hear whoop, whoop, whoop. That's a sound that comes from a parachute. Triton one was shot down. We only saw one shoot. So Crown controls the air up there and they said, can you hang in there and, and do rescue? They said, well, we didn't have any weapons except a gun because we'd already fired everything. And they said, yeah, except we're running low on fuel. And they said, we'll take care of that. And where we were, they weren't sending a 135 and I can guarantee you. But and some of those 135 pilots got really brave. <laughs> we weren't gonna encourage them in this area. And uh, next thing we know, we got a call from a Marine 130. And that was a tanker. Well, the nice thing about a thud, it has two methods of in-flight refueling. One's a slipway door that opens and a probe goes in. The other is a probe, a drogue, and there's a door on the side of the nose of a thud that opens up and out pops this probe. And that 130 was a drogue, so connect up, got our fuels. One F4 can't do that. So we stayed there. That was a four and a half hour mission. And thank God the G-suit was there because they had a button on the G-suit. And when you're sitting there for that period of time, cramped in that little airplane, your butt gets mighty sore. And not only that, but your legs go numb. But the G-suit has chaps bottom of that and around your gut, you can pump air into that thing and you get like a massage, <laughs> which was fantastic. The other thing we did in our flight suit, we carried four baby bottles and we were stupid because we could have created what we now do with these. The night before the mission, we get baby bottles, take the nipples, throw them away, put four bottles in the freezer and they would come out solid, two in each pocket of the, the flight suit had two pockets that, well has a pocket at the bottom of the leg and it would hold two so two at each side when you're coming out of there after you've done everything you pull one of those and pop it you think you're drinking champagne it's ice cold and oh my god <laughs> the feeling you can't even replicate in the description yes um a little off question Sometimes uh, the closing marking soldiers much later on get to meet each other and compare notes. Have you ever had the opportunity to talk to this in four more Vietnamese soldiers who were running the sand site for the anti aircraft stuff? Well, I didn't, but uh, uh, Dan can tell you about a guy that we're, we had last night. He was one of the boat people, but we had a bunch of generals that were down in San Diego that belonged to, went to the QB meetings. 
Quiet Birdman. They were uh, former Vietnamese generals and pilots. And uh, I think the I think the last one died now. They were pretty old, but uh, they were down there, and yeah, they, that's where a lot of the material you're getting now that tells you about how many they lost and and what the story was about the maids and that. Because they'll just tell you right out. There was one I read the other day, and it was a a very long 16 page deal written by one of their generals, talking about what they thought and. and uh, and it's really interesting. I said, geez, why don't you tell us that then? <laughs> yeah. Did you get any insights? Well, yeah, you well, the insight is is something that you use in the future. Right. But uh, this is history. Huh? I guess what I'm saying is reading their material or talking to them, did you go, oh yeah, we totally did have it figured out, or wow, there's stuff we didn't see that was going on. Uh, um, because it's a different perspective. It yeah, might be a, a, it certainly was. So when you read it, you say, "You're wrong. I know how many we had, and you're not near right." <laughs> so you have to go through that, and you say, "Well, that's okay. He's writing what he thinks." But then you watch for those elements, of like how many Sam sites they lost, and how many of this and and that, and what they were doing, and they had they had an equation they used to. See, those SAM sites were mobile. So you go up there and say, I know where the site is. When did you know that? If it was more than an hour and a half ago, you're wrong, because they moved it. <laughs> and they could move that, because you know that jams don't sweat. And the missiles, they were on wheels. The carriers and the launchers, they moved them every time. And they had a good way of hiding too. The one thing I never wanted to do, and I didn't have the chance, which that, that's why I'm here. I wanted to go right down low and go right over that van. But that missile we had, the only purpose was to take out the antenna on the van. And you saw that explosion that I showed earlier. That was taking out the antenna of a van. And that was an AGM-78. And they got to know by the call signs and they just shut the radar off if, you, if you're in the area. Well, I'm sorry I bored you so much. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, thank you very uh, much. Well, Can I ask you one, one last question? You mentioned earlier that uh, on one of those radar sites, you could tell when they needed to change the magnetron. How, how could you do that? Well, we had enough sensitivity. I don't know if people heard the question. Could you repeat oh. the question? Sure. Uh, he, he mentioned that, that, that they could tell when the uh, radar site magnetron would, needed to be changed. And, uh, and I'm just curious how, how he was able to do that. Well, first of all, you know, it's important to know what it was before. So if you go in there enough and that same radar stays on, you can get a pretty good glimpse of what the signal looks like. And after a time, the signal kind of changes because the magnetron doesn't have the oomph it used to have, and magic happens. Now in Vietnam, we didn't play that game because first of all, we didn't care. All we wanted to do is make sure it didn't work. <laughs> but, and of course that means uh, we'd have to track everyone and they're moving all over the place. So you never know what's gonna be and who cares? All you want to do is make sure a bomb met it because jammers are lousy weapons. Bombs work better. <laughs> did that help? Yeah, I sure did. Uh, but 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 it wasn't like each individual site had a had a specific uh, magnetron signal that you could identify for for an individual site. When we were doing recce in Europe, it, it was so because they didn't change the systems that much. Once they were planted where they were working, they kind of stayed there, so you had the opportunity of looking at it again. I see. Now, if you say, well, if you if they moved it, could you identify it? We never went that far. Because our, our job was collection, not analysis in that sense. But I'm sure somebody could. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic presentation. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you.